Okay, maybe we should start then. And it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Yao from from Tsinghua University, who's going to call, who's going to talk about quasi-local quantities in isolated momentum in general relativity. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I found a picture uh, that we had in uh, uh, Harvard about uh, 15 years ago. I mean, not uh, 13 years ago during my uh, 60th birthday. And you see here's a great picture with Ken smiling and uh, Hamilton and Choi Skin. So I'm very happy to. Uh, give this talk um, in honor of uh, Ken's uh, 80, uh, 80th birthday. Uh, we have been more than 50 years uh, knowing each other. I'm very proud uh, uh, of this long-term friendship and has been working well together. I always admire her creativity and depth in mathematics, and I really uh, feel great to be her friend. Uh, in any case, I wrote a, some, uh, something for Dan Free to talk about it later. I'm sorry that I could not come because of the pandemic and many other reasons uh, that I uh, would prefer to explain uh, face to face that I could not uh, attend in Princeton. Uh, I would actually very happy to come and would be very interested in come, but there's some important manner I could not uh, attend uh, physically. But in any case, I'm going to talk about a subject that I think Ken would have been interested in, in any case. So this is about mathematical general relativity, which we already start to uh, develop in 1970s. Uh, and it's based on joint work with my students, uh, Punan Chen, Wu Da Wang, uh, who are my students, and then two grand students, Jordan Kara and uh, Yi Kai Wen. So uh, this is a long story, but I will restrict to an important uh, 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 item, namely the angular momentum at now infinity, which measures the angular momentum carried away by the gravitational waves. And this is very important because of the recent uh, uh, development of black hole physics where one sees them, some energy was carried away by the waves. And this largely was due to angular momentum. So uh, one need to understand what that means because uh, we can talk about angular momentum uh, physically, but in fact, in order to, to make it to be well defined is quite an important question that one needs to answer. The reason is that the ambiguity actually, when you define such a concept, the ambiguity has been going on for more than 50 years uh, uh, in the history. And uh, so I will uh, talk about it a little bit later. So this super translation ambiguity caused major difficulty to properly define angular momentum. And we like to see how we can resolve it, at least from our point of view, from the subject of quasi-local conserved quantity that Mu Da Wang and I and several other people has developed. So first of all, we know uh, why we talk about quasi-local instead of local. Uh, the reason is that mass in general relativity um, uh, is typically defined because there's no density for gravitation alone. Uh, because by Einstein's uh, equivalence principle, uh, the density would depend uh, upon the first order differentiation of the space-time metric. But the choice of normal coordinate uh, make it to be equal to zero. And Einstein's equivalence principle says that they should be independent of choice of coordinate. So therefore, you cannot define a concept of mass density. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have to figure out a different way to do it. Uh, so Penrose has proposed, and including Hawking also, they want to associate conserved quantity to a space-time region enclosed by two space-time surfaces. Uh, this uh, is important, and in fact, uh, Penrose leased it uh, in 1978, uh, during the special year we had in Princeton, in the Institute of One Study, uh, where uh, we have a large group of uh, geometers 
uh, including Ken, including Bob and uh, Rick Shen and many people who were there. And Panos was invited by me to give a talk uh, during the time. And he proposed uh, the uh, first major problem for ma mathematical general relativity was quasar local mass and the definition of quasar local angular momentum. He lists it as number one and number two problems in that uh, conference. And this was published in the book uh, called Seminars on Dependent Geometry, appeared in 1982 in Princeton University Press. So the, the title of the paper is called Some Unsolved Problems in Classical General Relativity. So this number one and number two problem. Well, there are many reasons to search for quasar local concept because many important statements in general relativity make sense only with a good definition of such a quasar local mass. For example, uh, if we want to define what a gravitational binding energy of two bodies rotating around one another, we need to know the total mass, which we know how to define in terms of ADM mass. But then the individual bodies, uh, the mass of individual bodies cannot be defined by using the formulation of ADM. So we need a uh, good definition of quasar local quantities as a result. And besides that, uh, I always feel that a good definition of quasar local mass would help to control the dynamics of the gravitational field. Such con control would be complement to the energy method in hyperbolic equation that people have been using, especially in the world uh, that many people uh, have been using, Crystal Doroga, Kahneman, Kahneman, and many other people in the study of stability analysis of the care metric. And these are more intrinsic because it creates a local mass, um, intrinsic to gravity. So what do we do? We take a two-dimensional space-time surface which is space time, uh, not space time, space light surface, which is topological two sphere. So it will be the boundary of a three dimensional space time region. So we want to associate a quantity to this two dimensional space light surface. And uh, this uh, has been explored by many, many people, which I would not have time to go into detail. This was explored by Hawking, by Penrose by Brown, by York, and many, many people. And Rudolf and I looked at this uh, for many years. And based on many uh, development on these people that I just mentioned, we finally come up with a quantity which depends only on the extrinsic and intrinsic geometry of the surface sitting in space time. So the, the quasar local mass would depend only on the concept of the second fundamental form and the intrinsic metric of the, uh, the surface. So this is the concept uh, that we were able to do, which I will describe immediately. We assume the surface has to, has to have space like mean curvature beta. Now, this is not a, uh, a, a assumption that we uh, like to keep forever, because some interesting situation uh, 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 comes into uh, the problem when the mass when the, when the mean curvature vector is not quite uh, space-like, but uh, we have to stick with it at this moment. Now, so given uh, the surface, uh, two-dimensional space-like surface, there's a normal bundle. The normal bundle has a connection, and the connection one form is defined in the following way. Uh, the mean curvature, we normalize it, and then we take J, which is the reflection of the mean curvature vector through the incoming light cone. And this defines the condensation form on the normal bundle. So this is equipped uh, uh, for the surface with the second fundamental form information and the metric. So what do we have? We have a pair, a triple in fact, namely sigma. Sigma is a metric on the two dimensional surface. H is a mean curvature vector in a normal bundle. Alpha H is this condensation one form. So what we have is that uh, given a two-dimensional space size surface, we have a triple. Uh, this triple is sigma h and alpha h. Given this quantity, we are going to associate a mass, a all kind of conserved quantity based only on this uh, uh, data. So first of all, what do we do? We consider something called optimal isometric dependent equation. We want to embed 
this sigma, this two dimensional surface into the Minkowski space time, where the image surface sigma naught will be sitting in Minkowski space time, and it will automatically have similar data, namely the metric sigma, and also a new mean creature vector, and a new, and a new condensed one form, which I denote by H naught and alpha H naught. So what do we have now? We have two surfaces. One is sitting in space time sigma, and the other one is sigma naught sitting in Minkowski space time. So two triple uh, uh, quantities that we are associated with now. And then we define a, uh, a embedding, isometric embedding, and we can define uh, some entity associated with it, which we're minimizing. Uh, let me not talk into detail how do we define this entity and all that. But let me tell you how we de uh, uh, decide uh, how to find the quasi-local quantity. So what we do is that we take a future timeline unit killing field in the space time. Our three common one, such a guy of course exists. And in fact, what we do is just choose a constant vector. And this would be a, uh, a, uh, a vector field where the observer in uh, Minkowski space time are traveling. And they, they will look, the observer will observe the embedding sigma naught. And then we define the time uh, function uh, x dot t. So x is the position vector. So this is a time function uh, that we define according to the observer. So tau is a time function. And then we can find the following two quantities. Rho is the quantity associated here. Uh, where H naught, as I said, the mean curvature vector sitting in Minkowski space time for the sigma naught, and tau is a time function I just defined. And so we take the uh, difference of these two quantities uh, in the numerator, and then normalize it by square root one plus gradient tau square. So this uh, low is a density function on the two dimensional surface. And we define a one form JA uh, defined in this form. And turns out, uh, whatever entity we use, uh, the optimal isometric embedding equation uh, is obtained by uh, uh, Hamilton Jacob, but not Hamilton, by various, by various principle, it turns out to be the following simple uh, quantity, namely is isometry. So the norm of dx squared is equal to sigma, sigma is a metric, and then divergence j equals zero. So this is the equation uh, we want to uh, solve. And uh, so given a sigma, we want to find isometric embedding such that the divergence JA is equal to zero, where JA is defined by this quantity, okay? And then the quasi local mass that we define will be simply the integral low. Uh, as I said, this uh, embedding equation is obtained by optimizing some entity, which is associated to to the uh, uh, gravitational uh, uh, relational principle. Okay, the quasi local mass defined this way turns out to be very useful. First of all, it is positive in general uh, if the space time satisfies the energy condition, local energy condition. So this takes a lot of work to prove, but it is true. And uh, well, this actually was studied, uh, the special case of this was studied by Brown and York especially, and also studied by Melissa Liu and myself, uh, generalizing that, uh, what Brown and York did, and then there's several other people. And these are, uh, are the quantity that uh, one use in those uh, formulation, integral absolute value, x naught minus integral x absolute value. And these are not quite the same as what uh, we just defined there. Uh, we actually take a much more refined uh, uh, version of this quantity. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> what uh, this quantity that was used before are two positive. Uh, Liu and uh, Marisa Liu and myself uh, demonstrate is positive, but unfortunately, it's not zero when the surface is sitting in Minkowski space time. Uh, but what Mu Wang and I did is that this quantity that we just define up here, uh, this integral low is actually positive in general and is equal to zero if the surface is sitting in space time, Minkowski space time. So it doesn't give extra quantity. 
the previous de definition uh, give something that is not desirable, that means too positive. This one is on the other hand good, the seal for surface in the Minkowski space town. Now this embedding, uh, the actual embedding surface is actually unique in the Minkowski space time that matches the physical surface. Uh, so this is very good, especially when the surface is very close to the infinity, asymptotic infinity. And uh, this uh, has been uh, very uh, important uh, because uh, when the when the surface, two-dimensional surface is asymptotic to infinity, along the spatial direction, it gives rise to something uh, very calculable. And the uh, isometric embedding equation is actually solvable perturbatively. And this we can use that to calculate many uh, uh, local energy in that way. And now uh, what we're going to do is to apply this definition to, uh, to consider its limit at the spatial and now infinity and recovering the ADM mass and the bondi Charman mass. Uh, that turns out to be fine. We can do that. And, and, and this works out nicely. So let's take a look at what's going on. So given an initial data set where we have a three-dimensional space-like hypersurface and a metric G on the three-dimensional uh, slice and K is a second fundamental form, uh, which is asymptotic flat in the sense that outside compass set, the metric G is close to be the Euclidean metric up to some error, uh, R to the power minus P and the second fundamental form is big O, R to the minus Q, when R goes to infinity, where R is the radius of the ball. And P is supposed to be bigger than half and Q is bigger than three over two. The reason to make that assumption is actually to make sure the ADM mass defined in this integral is well-defined quantity, uh, uh, that it converges. And this was uh, uh, well-defined and was actually studied by Robert Barnett, my former student uh, in Princeton. And this turns out to be good. But we have to assume P bigger than half and Q bigger than three over two in order to make sure they converge nicely. The limit of the quasi-local mass that we calculate on the coordinate sphere, we cover the ADM definition, the one that moved our way and I do. But for more general asymptotics, the ADM definition are no longer true because it diverges potentially. But in our cases, the definition gives a well-defined conserved quantity. That's just still satisfied desirable rigidity and invariance property. So that was pretty good, even when P is not exactly uh, uh, restrictive, namely P need not be strictly bigger than half. And uh, this is uh, uh, important because uh, the, the uh, situation we are doing is finite. We are isometric embedding a finite surface into Minkowski space time. And we, we don't need to take limit at the, at the very beginning. So we can assume that P need not be uh, bigger than half at the very beginning. Now, these are useful because once we know how to do things quasi locally, we can take limit in a careful manner. So now let's go to now infinity. Why we go to now infinity? An idealized distant observer is situated at future now infinity where light waves approach along now geodesic. The light travels along now geodesic, and we are, the observer is sitting there and, and capturing the light. Well, the dynamics of the uh, space time are uh, captured by this now infinity. The description of the now infinity for an isolated uh, gravitation system are uh, described by several uh, important papers. The first important paper was due to Bondi and Sachs in 1960s. And then panels uh, make the conformal compatibility after that uh, in 1965. And, and, and by 1993, much later, Pisodoto Kaiman do the television analysis of Minkowski space time, give a more precise description of I plus. Now, both bony cells and panels formulation implies there's a peeling property. This is an idealized property that may not hold in general. This was demonstrated by Crystal and Kaleman. Peeling property is not true. Therefore, the kind of compatibility the panels use is uh, not ideal. 
But nevertheless, uh, every people is still using it because uh, one can talk about it. Uh, so we still want to describe the distant observer using the boundary sex formulation. And this result can be extended uh, to a little bit more general uh, than bo what boundary sex used uh, due to several people in 1995. But in any case, I think I will just uh, restrict to boundary sex for this uh, talk. So what do we do? Bondi and his collaborators postulate a coordinate system at infinity, now infinity, in which the metric tensor is written in the following form. Uh, UV du square, and, and then there's metric HAB defined on the sphere, and WA is a shifting uh, there. So this is the uh, tensor that the space-time metric is supposed to look like. And we are assuming the space-time is asymptotic flat in the sense that U and V will asymptotic to one, and HAB will be asymptotic to the standard uh, sphere coordinate, sigma AB. Sigma AB is a round sphere coordinate. We normalize the whole thing by requiring determinant HAB equal to determinant sigma AB. This is simply a coordinate change. And we want WA equal to zero as R go to infinity. So this is the uh, uh, condition that uh, is assumed in the boundary sax coordinate. Uh, so an important assumption, which is not necessarily the right assumption, is that uh, we impose all metric coefficient U, V, H, A, B, W, A can be expanded into power series of one over R. As I said, you may put in some log and all that kind there, and this was studied by several people, as I mentioned before. So Bondi, uh, in the 1960 paper, found the physics of gravitational field are encoded in the coefficient power series expansion. So these are dynamics of the uh, uh, space-time uh, metric. So now remember this metric, which describes the dynamics. And uh, so uh, it's important that uh, we do expansion of HAB and the expansion of WA. And uh, in the expansion of HAB, there will be a, uh, in the one over R term, there will be a C tensor, which you encounter a little bit later called CAB. And WA, the expansion will involve uh, something called uh, uh, N also. So, so we will come that into that. But remember, the expansion of HAB and expansion of W give rise some important information that we need to use. Okay, first of all, the expansion V, uh, U and V appears. And V, appears with such an expansion, and the first term is called the mass aspect, mux on i plus. And we integrate this fellow over the sphere at infinity. This will give rise to the boundary charman energy momentum tensor. So eu is integral to m, the mass aspect, and pku will be the linear momentum. So this defines something called boundary mass, and uh, the boundary momentum. Uh, so since uh, Charman actually uh, discussed this earlier uh, in a little bit more, uh, somewhat more restrictive form, so we call it boundary Charman energy momentum tensor, better. Now from the evolution of the mass aspect function, it follows that um, the differentiation of total energy, total energy is the boundary energy, so boundary energy is measuring the energy uh, you see from in this now coordinate. Now you defend this energy with respect to you. Uh, so it turns out there's a very famous uh, uh, boundary uh, energy loss formula. It's integral of uh, n squared minus 104. n is a new function which comes out from the expansion of those tensors I mentioned earlier. And, uh, now this is extremely important. This says that when the mass, boundary mass is evolving, it goes down. Uh, so uh, the, the, the total energy that goes down is measuring the energy radiated away. So del E is the energy measuring from E to the infinity minus E minus infinity. So the total energy got lost is this double integral that you saw here. So you can say that this is a total energy radiated away. 
Now, on the other hand, there's a symmetry of I plus, and this is called BMS group. Uh, what is BMS group? These are the coordinate transformation at now infinity, which keeps the boundary sex coordinate form. So you look at the group of diffeomorphism, uh, coordinate transformation, which keep the form of the uh, coordinate. Well, in general, there's no preferred coordinate system in the general space time. There's general relativity. Uh, there's no preferred coordinate system. Now, then we could have a different boundary sex coordinate measuring uh, uh, the same thing and just change coordinate. Uh, what is the most uh, uh, obvious change is I just change u by u bar plus fx. So a function of x independent of u. Now you see, if you use this coordinate transformation, you look at this uh, boundary sex form, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, uh, so it's still the same form. So once you do this one, uh, you know that uh, this is the ambiguity that appears. Namely, you can do this transformation, uh, u map to u bar plus fx. And such a transformation is called super translation. And this one is uh, causing trouble because this group is infinite dimensional. So the BMS group has a subgroup of infinite dimensional uh, super translation sitting there. Well, it turns out the transformation of the mass that we discussed uh, uh, and the shear tensor, which is obtained by uh, expanding HAB uh, to the first order term. And this turns out to be complicated. However, the transformation of new tensor is simple. The new tensor is ob obtained by differentiate the, 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 uh, the CAB, the, the shear tensor. Uh, so this is uh, rather interesting. Uh, first of all, it follows that the total energy radiated away computing U coordinate is the same as in the U bar coordinate. Uh, you see, the new function turns out to be very good uh, behave under the super translation. It uh, doesn't really change. And, and so therefore, the total energy radiated away uh, does not make any difference. Uh, it's well defined. Uh, but then uh, there's ambiguity in t for the angular momentum, which we are going to deal with now. Then that's a major problem for a long time. Uh, so what is our technology that we want to use in doing this? First of all, we observe that the quasi-local mass that uh, Muda Wang and I define, and now infinity recovers the boundary charm and mass. So you take the sphere at the cut and then take limit, you will recover the boundary mass. And for surface near the now infinity, the optimal isometric embedding actually has a unique solution. So that's very good. Uh, it says it's unique, global unit. And then we can calculate this unique solution asymptotically. And this non-negativity non of the boundary charm and mass actually follows from our calculation because we proved that the quasi-local mass is non-negative. So since the boundary mass is the limit of our mass, so therefore it's non-negative. Now, actually, um, the proof of the boundary mass to be non-negative has been uh, debated um, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, 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 several groups claim to prove the boundary mass is positive, including uh, Richard and myself. Uh, I won't say those proofs are wrong, but the proofs are too sketchy. And also there's some interesting question to challenge it actually. But this, this proof is absolutely absolute no problem. Uh, from uh, There's no divergence problem and all that. Well, this process is very good. We carry it out in an asymptotically hyperbolic uh, initial data set where the now infinity is rougher and more rough and more erratic uh, uh, due to radiation. Uh, so we do not need any peeling structure at now infinity. The peeling structure was assumed by many people, which is not acceptable uh, uh, in many ways because peeling can be wrong. Anyway, the definition of angular momentum turns out to be far more complicated and more subtle. Uh, many approach has been proposed and you see the, the number of people uh, writing in the, in the second paragraph, uh, which I do not want to go through all of them. Uh, all of them make important contribution and some of them uh, uh, has several some part of it is similar to what we do here. Uh, so the, the, the first important paper that relate to ours is this uh, paper, Dre and Schaubert. This 
they define a U cut, uh, so U equal to constant is defined to be this integral. Uh, so what is this? Uh, so Y A is a uh, rotational vector field, uh, and N A is a expansion of W A when you expand W A, which appear in the in the metric tensor. C A B is uh, obtained by the first order perturbation of H A B, the coefficient of that. So this was written down, and sometimes Na is called the mass angular momentum expand. The reason is that this Na actually appears in all definitions from everybody that has been involved in, uh, in approaching this question. Well, uh, on other why we care about it so much. According to larger panels uh, in the book that I mentioned, uh, the very concept of angular momentum get seeped by this super transition. And it's hard to see in this circumstance how one can rigorously discuss such question as the angular momentum carried away by gravitational radiation. So this is a question we need to address. Uh, when we say that a radiation and then the angular momentum will be carried away, we have to understand what angular momentum is, first of all. So we, we have to deal with that. So let's, let's see what that means. Well, suppose we have two boundary sex coordinates. One is u bar x bar, one is u x, and they differ by super translation, which I discussed before. And for each of them, there is a total uh, angular momentum carry away. We want to compare that. Uh, so del j bar, j q to f, f is obtained. Uh, <coughs> f is a super translation that change one boundary coordinate to another boundary coordinate. We want to see what this guy is uh, because we want to see that they do not really change uh, 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 if you use super translation. So that's the question we want to address though. The total angular momentum ambiguity. Well, uh, we, if we assume that Lewis tends to the case in the reasonable way, which is uh, uh, reasonable, uh, we will assume a similar fact and all that. And we suppose they are related by super transition F, we actually could write down uh, the difference uh, in a closed form. It's integral over the sphere at infinity times 2F, F is the super transition, times this uh, 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 <coughs> M minus, which is the mass aspect at infinity plus infinity and mass aspect at minus infinity. So we get this formula, which we compute uh, about a couple of years ago. And this formula we are going to use to deal with the super transition ambiguity. Okay. So, first of all, what is angular momentum in our definition that we use so far? We have not spelled it out correct, clearly. So, what we do is that we take a healing field, uh, Y of R3, one. For example, we take the rotational vector field. And, and, and there is an optimal uh, embedding. We define a corresponding conserved quantity associated to y by this uh, integral. So minus low t naught dot y. So t naught dot y is actually uh, the measuring of the uh, constant vector t naught uh, with y, uh, how they, the coefficient of that, plus j. j is the angular moment, uh, not the angular moment, uh, j. The j is a vector field I defined before uh, in the definition of. Uh, of uh, uh, quasar local mass. Maybe I, I show you back to you how it looks like. Uh, so here is the, the way that it comes out. We have low with J. J is defined on the sphere. And low is a scalar quantity. J is a vector field defined the sphere. So we use that to define this uh, um, uh, uh, quantity. So J is a vector field operating on Y, T, uh, the projection of Y on the tangent bundle of the surface. Then the quasar local momentum, angular momentum is simply integral j of yt. Uh, so this is a uh, quantity we use. And this angular momentum is defined on a quasar local level. Namely for finite surface, we can use this as definition of angular momentum. We <coughs> set several important invariant properties. So, and then we take the limit of this one to infinity and we call it the total ang angular momentum. So that's how we define our angular momentum. 
I take limit of this value to infinity and, and get what we call angular uh, uh, um, total angular momentum, please. So what do we do? Well, uh, we compute it explicitly now. Uh, so this is the uh, carry out the definition that I put here. J is the quasi-local uh, quantity. And uh, this was written as a definition. But in the case when the surface are asymptotic to infinity in the correlate manner, I want to calculate this value, integral j y t. So that's how we do it. CAB, as I mentioned, is the first order expansion of the spherical metric in terms of the uh, round metric, uh, the first <coughs> order. So the C function. And then I, I look at this tensor and I decompose it into the following manner, uh, basically Hopf's decomposition. And here the important fact is that we found a scalar function C, small c here. Now this C is interesting because um, this C is globally defined on the surface, uh, not globally defined in space time, but it's globally defined on the two dimensional surface. This function C has never appeared in the previous definitions. Uh, all people use a more local definition. Uh, here we have a global definition defined on the two dimensional surface. And then we define Muda Wong and uh, 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 Pernan, Chen and me if associate to any rotational cooling field to define this angular momentum to, to be this quantity. It's not that we define it, we take, it turns out we take the limit. Uh, namely, if we take this definition integral JYT, we can carry out the calculation and turns out it is equal to this one. Uh, this quantity where small c, as I mentioned, appear in the decomposition of CAB. So this rather interesting, it appears in non-local form, non-local on the two-dimensional surface. And this, as I said, has never appeared before. And this turns out to be the key uh, that uh, the definition of the angular momentum we use turns out to be independent of the choice of quasi uh, of the super transition. So, uh, so what do we do? We look down uh, this uh, statement uh, under a super translation, which we expand it. Uh, the first term alpha naught is a constant. Alpha i is a linear uh, linear part of the expansion, and the f l bigger than equal to. These are in terms of spherical harmonic. You see the in the expansion spherical harmonic, the first term is constant. The second term is linear. The first eigenfunction. And the rest is higher MOP, higher harmonic, uh, uh, spherical harmonic. Then we prove that uh, the total flux of the, uh, the, the angular momentum we define from plus infinity to minus infinity, and we define according to the ambiguity that we want to know. Turns out we can prove that is equal to delta F uh, at the slice defined by super translation minus the guy with no super translation is equal to this right hand side. So then PJ here is the total flux of the boundary sex angular momentum. So this is obtained by integral by part of the previous definition actually. Now this is actually very good. It depends only on upper I, the linear part of the super translation. And, and also del PJ corresponding to the boundary sex linear momentum. So in this way, actually, delta j that we just define is invariant. Therefore, under pure super translation and the transformation rule, law is the same as the special relativity's angular momentum. Why? Because you don't expect this one uh, under translation, the total angular momentum does change. It changes according to the linear momentum. And this is what we see here. Uh, it does depend on the on the linear part of the F, and, and this is what we know in special relativity when you change the angular momentum. So this formula therefore says very clearly that the, um, that the angular, total angular momentum that, that we define is independent of super translation. So, uh, so this good, this, so we finally, after a lot of effort and many years of work, we finally have come up with a good definition of total angular momentum that are uh, transformed uh, 
uh, uh, according to what special relativity would require, and the high mook of F does not appear. Only the linear part appears. Uh, this is what we expect. Well, then there's many questions you want to uh, ask. For example, you will see uh, this, we are choosing a special uh, cross section at infinity uh, to uh, define this angular momentum. The question is that if a sequence of cross section at now infinity converges continuously to a given cross section, does the angular momentum converges or not? Now, this is an interesting question. At the beginning, we never thought about it. And uh, Professor Robert Rock, actually working with his student, pointed out this should be answered. And they, in fact, wrote to us uh, saying that uh, our definition must be uh, not good because it is not continuous. So we end up to be long uh, for a month discussion. At the end, uh, it turns out the current example is wrong. And in fact, uh, in the process, uh, we prove that this is true. That means it's continuous. So if a sequence of cross section now infinity converges, then the angular momentum does converge also. So this is in a way a good property uh, because it's not obvious in the in, uh, in, in the, the definition of the angular momentum as the angular momentum depends on high order differentiation. And in this way, therefore, uh, we actually prove more properties of the, the angular momentum that we define. Uh, well, there are several criteria uh, we like to deal with and, uh, and uh, uh, we are still exploring uh, more properties of it. But so far, the properties that we saw have been good and satisfy several good criteria that I won't uh, spend time uh, to discuss more. So this is a process that we dis discover in the last 10 years, starting from the definition of local, quasi-local mass, quasi-local angular momentum, and quasi-local uh, quantities in general. Uh, so when we use a Keeling field, we get all these classical quantities. But if you use different vector field, you could get some other quantities. And I think they are all interesting. And one needs uh, to explore them, uh, all this information much more. But I'm rather pleased that all this works out uh, fit in uh, so well uh, with each other. Uh, so uh, now, so we have a complete set of 10 conserved quantity in, uh, similar to what we learned special relativity. We have E, we have PK, we have JK, that's the angular momentum, and we have center mass, uh, the CK. And uh, this sets by an interesting uh, uh, properties. First of all, all these things are trivial in case we are sitting in Minkowski space time. And it is uh, uh, a case that for any possible boundary sex coordinate in Minkowski space time, these four quantities are zero. Uh, this sounds to be trivial, but it's actually non trivial. Because there are many possible boundary sex coordinates you can choose. Uh, we prove that it must be trivial for all of them. And, uh, and then uh, in the case of chair space time, uh, PK and CK vanishes, and E and, and JK recovers the mass and angular momentum as you expect for, for the K metric. So that's good. This recovers uh, what you expect. And, uh, and the general space time, the total flux uh, turns out to be super translation invariant, and also uh, these quantities and their fluxes transform according to basic physical laws under ordinary translation. So, so I think so far, uh, it matches with what we expect. And of course, we are still explore uh, many more properties to see whether we encounter any problem or not. But so far, I think uh, it looks good. So I think the talk is about 45 minutes. I stop exactly in the right time. Thank you. Well, happy birthday, Karen. Any questions? Well, uh, I, I had two questions, but I have to congratulate you on answering the first on this last yeah. slide because I wanted to see an example. But the second question is actually uh, really your fault in the sense that I <laughs> started looking at Nertus theorem and I wondered if that this invariant has any sort of relation to, well, I mean, you'd say, I guess, the uh, super translation or something. 
Uh, yeah, so not, as, not as a formula was used very early, which I did not discuss. When I do the uh, embedding, I minimize anything I call it some energy. The definition of energy, you make use of not as film uh, for uh, the Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, which, I, as I said, I didn't have time to go through that. And this part, this part of thing was actually used by everybody, Brown, York, and Hawking, and myself, and, uh, and, and, and Wu Dao. So not test film is great, and is, uh, I think, one of the greatest things in physics, and we, we share the thing, uh, every, everything has to use that, and we, we do use that, okay? We probably should, we should, probably should use it more uh, in the super translation part, but we use it at the very beginning, and maybe we can think about how to use it for the later part also. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so earlier you talked about using these techniques to um, get better estimates than you get from the kleinerman clistodoulou energy yeah. estimates. And recently these, these guys have proved the stability of um, the rotating black hole, the Kerr space time, but only up to small angular momentum. Yeah. And I'm wondering if any of these techniques can be used to either give a shorter proof of what they prove, because their proof is very long and technical, or to go into the setting of greater angular momentum. Well, uh, greater angular momentum, actually, I studied it with Joe Smaller, my, my good friend and all that. When, but only for special mode expansion, and that's uh, that could be larger angular momentum. But in general, this is a long-term project. I, I, we are mathematicians, we, we move step by step. So it takes us a long time to finally understand this quasi-local formulation. It took me many years. I, and I believe this quasi-local formulation can be used to replace the L2 method and all that. But it's still too early to, to say. I'm moving slowly to, to make the groundwork to be good. And uh, these are intrinsic definitions and I, I'm, <coughs> sure that this could be used to help uh, to understand the energy method better. But it's too early for me to say anything for that. Can I ask one more? Yeah. So I think what Karen was asking is now these things, some of these objects are invariant under super translation. Is right. there an application of Noether's theorem to get some kind of conservation law specifically out of super translation invariance? Well, um, <coughs> uh, uh, we have not thought about it, so let me put it in this way, and, but we are very pleased uh, that we found such a quantity which is invariant, and we are still checking every possible thing that may uh, create problems. Because many, as I said, there are more than uh, 20 people working on this subject, and, uh, and um, and I want to convince every people this is a good definition before I go to applications. So, so I want to make sure that everybody agrees this is good. As far as I'm concerned, this is good, but still uh, trying to spend time to make sure everybody agrees. So I will think about what you said, what you and Karen said, but uh, right now I have not uh, spent time on it yet. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? I have a more meta question for uh, for you. So, so actually, it's two. So the first one is the meta question. So you're using this isometric embedding of a two sphere into yeah. Minkowski space as a, as a model space, right? And it's a little, it's a little, it's a bit reminiscent of something that was done more than 150 years ago when you take an isometric embedding of a curve into Euclidean space to understand the holonomy of a connection. I mean, it wasn't said that way that long ago, but this this idea of using the isometric embedding of a, of a two-dimensional object, a two-sphere, it, it seems to be some higher kind of holonomy. That's, that's a, it's kind of a weird meta question I'm asking. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on being able to do this, because you're, you're picking this model space to compare the general space time. You make well, space let, me, let me put it this way. I've been working now with several postdocs trying to use this as a new sigma model Mm. And uh, and it's not trivial. We are still working on it, uh, so I won't uh, discuss too much as here. <laughs> Fair so, enough. So, post-Kerr in space time, 
is like uh, uh, loop space. So we are looking at sigma model. Okay, I have, a, I have a second, but more down to earth question, I hope. So, yeah. um, so s maybe it's not these quantities, but certain kinds of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, isoparametric inequalities, one can re reinterpret those, the, sort of the discrepancy between, for example, an isoparametric inequality on a general space. Usually this is done only in the case of uh, Carton Hadamard spaces, but uh, yeah. as, as a double integral over the boundary. And I'm wondering whether the double integral is really, you look at the behavior of geodesics on the interior and how they meet the boundary. It's a sort of scattering property of how geodesics meet the boundary. And you re-express the quantities as a double integral over the boundary. I'm wondering whether any of these, the angular momentum quantities or even the quasi-local mass quantities have an interpretation sort of more even more synthetically as a double integral over this two sphere of how certain geodesics meet the boundary it's just a vague question i don't know whether you thought about that well I'm, I'm i'm not interested in very standard space time i'm more interested in space time with dynamics the two dimensional surface may encode something which is extremely complicated mm -hmm. the geodesic behavior inside the domain is so complicated that is probably uh, doesn't make sense to talk too much about it. There are black holes, there are uh, their next singularity and all that. I'm interesting. Uh, I'm mean, actually trying to avoid those uh, those, those things. Uh, so the quasi local formula is very good because it just depends on the boundary. It's not, it does not depend on the detailed information inside the domain that you found. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually trying to avoid the, those questions you ask because the two of behavior are, are very complicated. Yeah, okay, but fair enough. I was thinking of turning it the other way around, though, actually. So you could infer something about the interior dynamics by identifying it. I, I have no idea whether there's any kind of identification abstractly with that. But well, as anyway. I said, uh, it could be interesting, but uh, in most of the inverse problem people deal with, uh, they are assuming the interior, not too bad. Mm -hmm. And which I, I, right now, I'm trying to not to make those assumptions. Uh, the interior should be allowed to be quite complicated. Got uh, it, thanks. More questions. I, I have one question. Um, Professor yeah. Dia, what's known so far about rigidity in this case? Well, I mean, as I said, if the sphere is close enough to be round, then it's rigid. That's unit. Mm -hmm. In fact, global unit, we can prove that. But when the surface is not close to be round, then, the, then I think it's non unit and it's expected because in a strong field, uh, spheres, uh, collide, and all kind of interesting questions appear. And this exactly uh, measures the strong uh, vibration of the space time, I think. Uh, so the non uniness is expected, and how to measure non uniness should be turned into some quantity to measure how bad the space time are uh, uh, dynamically move there, in fact. But when you are close to Round spheres near infinity, for example, you know everything is tame and therefore is unique. But when you, you know, start not, not to be unique, uh, things are interesting and difficult also. Right. Okay, that's, that's how it comes out. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let, let's thank Professor Yang then again.